welcome to Witness Rugby Chat episode 24. Um, a, a quick apology actually for me, we've had some technical gremlins which means that um, there's not not all of the video that I wanted to show you from the Members Night last week is available. I have got a chat with Kieran Pertle and Hep Kale from the Members Night where a few further questions and insight is provided to what's been going on at the club. Um, I have had a bit of a scour through the q and I think from last week's episode everything was pretty much covered there. There is another night at the club on Wednesday next week which is for sponsors. I'll be there as well so there may be some further insight from that which I will endeavour to provide you on next week's show, possibly the week after depending on how it all goes. Um, Bit of a rush one this week, I must apologise, I unfortunately won't be at the Summer Bash, I am working in Barcelona, someone's got to, so um, I'm off there on Thursday to uh, to go and cover the Catalan Wigan game at the new Camp, bit of a once in a lifetime opportunity, that one I did look at trying to get back for Blackpool on Sunday, unfortunately it wasn't possible, but of course we'll be tuning in on Sky. Um, a, a quick word actually on Challenge Cup, um, the defeat against Wakefield last week, 26-6, thought very harsh scoreline on Witness, three late tries scored by Wakefield, putting a bit of gloss on the scoreline. Um, I still haven't seen any highlights anywhere and I'd love to see the second Wakefield try again because I felt that uh, Witness were a little hard done to. Um, I thought Jack Owens might have grounded it in goal off David Fafita's kick. Um, he then pinched the ball and scored a try. And, I have no doubt that that was one of the reasons why Jack Owens uh, had a pop at the touch judge, which resulted in his red card. He got sent off with about 16 minutes to go, which was 12-6 at that time. Um, and I think without that try, if it had stayed, the longer it stayed 6-all, I think the more witness may have fancied it. Um, obviously it wasn't to be, and then eventually in the last five or six minutes, witness ran out of legs. Of course, the extra man, you know, Wakefield were basically just using the extra man and scoring in the, in, in the corners, um, which made it look like... A, you know, I've not really seen anyone talk about it as a as a potential upset or anything like that over the weekend. Whereas if it had finished 12-6, maybe um, Witness might have got a bit more credit than they did do. Um, Jack Owens, of course, sent off for dissent. Um, I've been told what he has said, and I probably shouldn't repeat it on on this show. But a uh, two match ban for him, so he'll sit out the game against Lee on Sunday and York next week. Um, disappointing, I suppose, from Witness point of view to lose a player in that manner. Um, especially, you know, at the moment when bodies, there's, you know, witness short on bodies. Uh, I believe Asher, Oliver Asher Bott has started training again. Um, so he's obviously not too far away, but I'd imagine Lloyd Roby will probably go in at fullback. Uh, I think he's probably had his best games there. Um, a lot's going to depend on whether Gellin's back, of course, and, and maybe even Harrison Hansen, and then push Christine into the centres, perhaps. So that's a, a possible option for this week. Uh, a big... A big game, it has to be said, against Lee. Of course, Lee will probably want to get one back on Widnes after the Good Friday game. Um, and, of course, Widnes had a few iffy results since then, you know, the three defeats to Batley, Dewsbury and York. But if you look at Widnes' record against the top teams this season, it's been exemplary, and I'm sure that they'll want to, to keep that going uh, at the weekend. Um, a few other bits from this week before I push you out onto the interview with Kieran Pirtle and Hepkale from the Members' Night last week. Um, a bit of grief, the club got a bit of grief or, or well I suppose it depends on the way you look at it the club or the fans 87 fans apparently went to Wakefield on Friday as reported in one of the trade papers this week um, I'm not sure how they come to that figure there certainly wasn't many witness fans but I'm not sure how you can be that specific because you know, I and I've seen a few other comments like this I went and paid for my ticket um, I wasn't wearing witness colours, I was uh, I was actually wearing my Love Rugby League jacket and uh, no one asked me who I supported and I went in through the home end and well yeah so uh, I'm not sure having a swipe at fans is a, is, a, is a great thing to do, especially not witness fans after all the fundraising and efforts that have been done this week uh, and we're always told that away fans don't matter and, and that's uh, you know when that's one of the arguments when people moan about well Toronto, Catalan, whoever don't bring any fans well we're told that away fans don't matter so you know you can't have it both ways they either do or they don't and uh, yeah so I'm sure there'll be a, a great support a great travelling support to Blackpool on Sunday of course 10 years ago this year um, since the Northern Rail Cup win against Barrow which ticked the box for Super League uh, I've seen the 40th anniversary dinner for the Challenge Cup win over Wakefield. I've not seen a 10-year anniversary dinner for the Northern Rail Cup. I'd like to see that, so if uh, the club are watching, then uh, maybe they could get some of the old guard together. Gavin Dodd, I'm sure, will be, uh, I'm sure he'd be available for, for a night there. So, um, 
just a quick comment on that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a sponsors event being organised by Dave Roll and Tracy Mohini, one of the directors. Um, I've got that wrong. It's Tracy Gallon Denning, isn't it? I've got that wrong. I've cut that out. Um, on Wednesday, there's a sponsors event on Wednesday night at the club. Um, you have to. There's information on the official club website at the moment. It's basically for all current, past, lapsed, or potential sponsors to give a bit of out, uh, outline what the club is hoping to achieve um, and some insight into it, both its problems and its prospects, it's fair to say. Um, my understanding is that the club are fairly comfortable or fairly confident about next season in terms of where they need to be and what they need to be to compete next season. A massive opportunity um, and probably the last opportunity really to have a real go at pushing for Super League. Of course, you're never quite sure who's going to come up in these silly American teams that are being um, shoehorned in. So next season may well be the best opportunity witness get of, of getting back into Super League. And, um, of course, with the season ticket money and the sponsorship money, that will be uh, a big boost for next season. So, like I say, I think there's no concerns necessarily about next season. It's just getting through the remainder of this season. And I'm sure that um, Dave Roll and those at the club will provide plenty of information on that to prospective sponsors on Wednesday, important of course that the local business businesses and uh, the local community gets behind the club. We don't want a repeat of what happened uh, previously, and of course now you know that the club is in good hands and it's not going to get frittered away on people's salaries. So uh, if you are a local business watching, or if you work for a local business, or even a national business, or you know of a business who may be interested, then please do get in touch with the club. Have a look on the website. Um, if you want to leave a comment or whatever on these videos. Um, I will be there on Wednesday night and I can pass on any messages if you can't find it on the club website. I'll take this opportunity as well to thank our sponsors, Musical All Sorts, PD Law, Arnold Gorse Financial Management and Deals The Jewellers. Uh, I know PD Law have already confirmed for the club night on Wednesday, so uh, hopefully they'll get involved with sponsorship at the club as well. Um, a few other bits, you may have seen my article on the debt, uh, on the pre-administration debt at Witness, £600,000 including more than £300,000 to the to the council, which, of course, I revealed after a Freedom of Information request earlier in the year. Um, pretty pretty damning, some of the figures, and, you know, a lot of comment has been made, you know, less than a year ago, the former CEO said that the club was debt-free and the historical debt had cleared, and clearly that was a, a blatant lie. So, um, yeah, and obviously a concerning thing, if you if you watched last week's episode with Phil Finney, the Q&A with Phil Finney, he revealed that the club has had to honour some of the debts of the old club to basically keep their supply chains open. Of course, there's, rugby league's a small a small game, it's a small world, and if you've not paid supplies in rugby or you've not paid clubs in rugby or you've not paid the RFL and or if you've not paid local hospitals, there's not really much, you know, you're not going to be able to use them again. So the new club has had to honour some of those debts. Um Obviously, I've had a lot of tweets asking, well, what can be done to to sort of, you know, hold the previous owners to account, and um, it's difficult to see. I mean, I've had a few Twitter exchanges about this. Obviously, it's very difficult because you've got private companies. Yeah, okay, sports clubs, and I think I've said this before, sports clubs are massive community interest companies technically, but they're all still private limited companies, and there's a lot of protection in place for directors there. There may still be things that come out in the woodwork. I've certainly got a few irons in, in freedom of information request fires uh, all over the place at the moment. So I'm just waiting to see if, if some of those come back. And if I'm when they do, maybe they may explore, uh, may help explore um, some other avenues. The other difficulty is you don't want to do anything that may harm the new club. Um, you may have noticed a couple of the debts, one being HMRC, one being pensions. Um, if pension contributions haven't been paid um, and there's an investigation into those it, it may it may even come back on the on the new club so there's also that and then of course who brings the action because you know if someone someone needs to take action against someone I don't think I think it's going to be very unlikely it gets to criminal proceedings so um, the other the other argument is well who's going to bring that case so I'm not too sure what will happen there but you know, we'll keep digging and see what we can find. Um, there's been an update on the club website as well about Vicky and their latest uh, statement from Jason. He's clarified where Vicky's or, or what's happening with Vicky. So he's basically, um, they've appointed a board. So there's five, I think, board members and their profiles are on the Vicky website, which is viqi.com. 
www.cloudfund.co.uk. Um, and Jason has outlined what's happened with the fund. So if you've not read that, the statements on both the club website and on the Vicky website, um, I guess some of the questions that I get asked, um, the main ones to be answered are the £100,000 that was raised via the GoFundMe page at Bethany Pennant and who's been on this show. So oh, that went into the club to help it's running. 20, a further 25000 um has gone on um, co ensuring the players didn't have to take a pay cut after the administration, so that plugged that gap. Um, and I think... I think a part of the hundred thousand is basically twenty five thousand of the hundred thousand effectively bought the fans a place on the board, which of course is occupied by Jason at the moment. Um, and he explains um, in the statement as well how they plan to communicate with fans and uh, get fans' opinions because you know technically the fans do get a say now uh, in uh, in board decisions and and on votes. So that'll hopefully become uh, ever increasingly clearer. Um, obviously, a good step. Good to see those sorts of things being in place, you know, real powerful, if done properly, the, the fans have now got a real powerful voice, 1,500 members of Vicky, and um, potentially now the, the, the wider collective of fans can ensure they have a say in the club and, of course, make sure that what happened earlier this year doesn't happen again. Of course, it's still important to sign up to Vicky as well. You can still sign up. The recommended membership is £15 per month, so um, certainly the club could probably do with that money sooner rather than later and like I, say, the, like I said earlier the challenge is getting through the rest of this season so um, if you aren't a Vicky member already please do sign up if you've got any other ideas for fundraising as well please do get in touch feel free to leave some comments on here and I'll pass them on to the uh, respective people of course Whistle are doing their fundraising activity as well um, there's a new fanzine that's going to be coming out very soon as well that um, I'm a little bit involved with but um all that geared towards raising funds for the club. So on that note, I'll apologise again for my technical gremlins that prevented um, a little portion of last week's members' night coming in this episode, but there is some insightful stuff with Kieran Pertil and a very quiet Hep Kale um, from the members' night, which was held at the stadium last week. That's it from me, though. Um, I'll see you next week. I possibly may record on Thursday. I may release I may be a day late next week as well because I may leave it till the sponsors night on Wednesday. I may not. I'll see how it goes. Please do like, subscribe to the channel, share on Facebook, share on Twitter. Please do leave me your comments. Don't forget to tweet me at JDG Sport. Uh, JDG Sport. And then don't forget to have a look at the forum as well, witnessrugby.com forward slash forum. Um, and we'll move on. Dave Rolt was hosted. Kieran Pertil and Hep Kale. Follow this. Okay, let's start with Kieran. First half of the season, either they just gone or it's about to, we're almost uh, half, halfway through the season. Uh, I'm going to start with first thing I want you to give us an insight into from a coaching perspective. How do you think the first half of the season has gone today? Well, I think Best of all, uh, please. I think it's fair to say the, the first half of the season has been a, a real roller coaster. Um, you know, from initially starting off with, with what we, we had as a squad, what we, we genuinely believe would be um, very competitive towards the top two teams uh, and a great chance of going up. And then going through administration kind of knocked us around a little bit. Um, but I think in saying that it knocked us around a bit, it also brought us together as a group, um, as players. So from, from, a, from a coaching point of view, I was really happy with the start we had. Um, but then I've also been really happy with how the groups come together and, and the young players have come in. Um, I know we've got through administration and, and you know, we, we've had some, some good wins. I think the, the one thing that we'll talk about is with the young group that we've got, that there will be some slight inconsistencies during the year. Uh, and, and that's part of development and, and players maturing. So I think overall I, I'm pretty happy with, um, with what we've done so far. We've still got a, a long way to go yet. And, we still got a lot of improvement in us as well. Okay, the second part of the second part of the question. What's your hopes and aspirations? You know, your goals that you're setting yourself or you're setting with the team for the second half of the season. Well, I think the, the major goal is is to win every single game. Um, we, we don't want to lose any games, and we never go into a game thinking uh, that we're going to lose it or going with a mindset that we'll, we'll take it easy. Um, Every single game we approach, we, we approach with a, a mentality that we want to win. That, that doesn't always happen uh, for, for one reason or another, but uh, I think for, for us as a group of players and, and as a club, we, we have to finish as high as we can, which Phil alluded to before, about financially as well. Uh, so there's some, some targets there for us that 
that we need to, to hit and, and reach for. Um, and we'll, we'll just we'll take every game as it comes, but ultimately we want to win every single game. Interesting. Interesting. And, and, and what I'd expect, and I'm going to be asking you from a playing perspective, very surely, yeah. Squad, we've obviously got a small squad. You know, it's made even smaller after we went into administration, we lost three plays. Uh, and average age, it's a, it's a young team, and we've got some players at the other end of the careers, you know, that it's quite weird for either one end or the other. Don't pass it to, don't pass it to, we need Friday night. I'm sure from, you know, again, from the head coach's point, does that present some challenges? You know, you're talking about the mental side of the game and, and young players getting used to backing up performance week after week and, and the expectations. Are you, are you finding that you're having to rely a little bit too heavy on, on the senior players or is the fact that we've got such a small squad, is the fact that you can't even, you, you, you struggle to rotate the players to give the senior players a little bit of downtime or the young players even a rest? When they, when they perhaps should need it. Yeah, it certainly has its, uh, its challenges. Like I said, uh, we've, we've got a squad where we've got a lot weighted towards the younger end, uh, and then we've got a lot weighted towards the, the, the top end, and then we've got Jack in the middle at, at 24, 25. <laughs> um, no, and if you think, if most people talk about uh, players reaching the peak or the potential, is probably between the ages of 25 and, and 30. So there's a few challenges in there. Uh, biggest challenge is whose music they're listening to in the gym, first of all. So if Sam gets his, uh, his tunes banging away and epping them, guys are not too happy with that. So that, that's a challenge in itself. Uh, but he likes a bit of like Campbell. Like, yeah, I don't know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> now go on, Kevin. Now go on, Elvis. You're, you're a bit older than me. And just a couple of weeks. <laughs> Challenging, young squad challenges. Yeah, so in, in terms of the challenge, obviously, um, if we look at the younger players, first of all, um, you know, a, lot, a lot of the guys, this is their first year uh, playing against men, um, and physically that has its, has its challenges, uh, particularly in the championship, there's a lot of uh, big, big, strong men, um, and probably some guys in there who are stronger than the Super League players, and uh, you know, these guys have, have been in Super League, they've dropped out, they've got jobs. Uh, mentally they mature as well as physically uh, and they can handle uh, certain situations so for a lot of our, our young guys is exposing them to situations um, <coughs> that they're not been used to and how they deal with that um, and, and one of those is probably playing week, week after week consistently uh, and maintaining the high levels uh, what's, what's needed every single week and I think if you look at any successful team who's brought players through at a junior level you, you tend to see a trend where you know, a young player will come in and he'll play really, really well for the first you know, three or four weeks and then his form kind of just dips and wavers a little bit and, and that's no disrespect to the player or anything, it, that's just what happens with young players and you know, at, at that point most, most clubs or most teams will probably uh, just take that, that player out the, the, the limelight or the top squad for a week or two and then, then bring him back in but the, the squad we've got is very light which you've said so we, we can't, we've not got the luxury of doing that so some of these you know, these young players have been fantastic so far this year. They, they've got to play their way through that and, and make sure every single week they try and play to the best, which is difficult uh, when you're not used to it. And obviously on the other side of that, Jim, do, do you feel that some clubs are actually lucky they can see a win that's got the young side, you know, they've got a tough game, they target it out with the game against us. There's not only a big game where there's going to be a bigger crowd if you know, we take a big following as we do, but they target it knowing full well they're going to be playing the young team. So we we'll do you think people are resting their players so they can play against us? Yeah, there's a there's a little bit of that. Um, you know, there's also the aspect that you know, Witness is still a, a big name in rugby league, and we are a full time team. And you know, Apple will probably talk about it. You can hear the, the teams we're playing against. You know, let's get into the full timers. Let's do this as a full time team, or we we'll beat a full time team. Uh, and a lot of these teams do raise the game. Uh, I said to the players that I'll, I might watch the the last two or three games from, from some of the teams we play against and the performances haven't been brilliant but when they play witness they raise the levels you know they, they, they come there and you know almost for some of them it, it's like a job interview as well they, they want to be playing full-time some of those players so certainly uh, it, it is difficult for it but you know we, we talk about the older end as well uh, you know the younger the younger players need managing but the, the older guys do and you know and i've relied uh, a lot on these guys in, in training on a daily basis and 
Uh, I think particularly in the early part of the season, not in games and minutes they played as well. You know, some some guys you know have played 400 games at, at rugby league, and, and that takes its toll on the body. So um, during a week, the, the challenge is for me is managing to make sure that the the older guys get on the field, which sometimes that means they're not being on the training field. Sometimes that means they're only getting uh, in with the team on captain's run, and, and over a period of time, that can affect the team and, and cohesion as well. Um, and, and how we train, so there's lots of challenges you've got to balance, and uh, every single week's different from from the next week. And you know what what comes out of a game can change your thoughts for the next game coming forward or the next week. So the the, the key is, is trying to balance all that out and. and you know, get the best balance for, for the young players to make sure they keep developing and getting exposed, but also making sure they're not too exposed and then making sure these old chaps get on the field. <laughs> In the nicest possible way. <laughs> nicest possible way. But on, on the subject of that, you know, players, you know, the, the amount of exposure they get. What's your thoughts on the Easter programme? Do you think it needs a serious look at? I think it does now. Uh, you know, in, in the past, I've, I've been involved, obviously, the coaching and playing, and it's just something you, you just get on with. It's always been there. Uh, but I think, you know, this year with the reduction of, of subs as well, we've we talk a lot about uh, player welfare, uh, and we've reduced the number of subs, um, but also the games getting quicker as well, um, and a lot more physical, and, and that's an effect. So I think they, they've got to be smart and. and Look after the players, and plus the, the game on a Monday, it's, it's always a, a, a less quality game. Um, you know, the entertainment's never usually as good. The, the crowds are never as big as well. It's, you know, the players are flat. The the, the support was a little bit flat. They, they've had the bank holiday weekend. They've had the Good Friday. And, uh, I think we were, we were looking at it as a game in all for, for money for value as well. I think it'd be better if that game was played and moved further along the season. Yeah, certainly, I know it's something that the, the other fellow are looking at. But very valid points there, Kieran. Let's look at, let's have a chat about uh, you know, how you analyse games. Okay, now, Sam, have we got a, are we ready to roll on this? Just, just before we, because obviously we've got, you know, as as we as we'd expect, you're going to have ebbs and the form ebbs and flows. And you want to? I'd, well, I'd be interested. I'm sure many people will be interested. In how do you how do you analyse it? Do you, do you analyse a defeat any different than you would a, a, a victory? How do you go about the analysis? And maybe give us an understanding of what we're looking at there on that spreadsheet. I think the uh, the difference between a defeat and a, and a win is I do with a smile on my face when we win. Do we all? But yeah, it's you no, know, it's a long process, um, and, and whether we, we win a game or lose a game, we generally go through uh, the same thing. Probably to most people on there, that's double dutching doesn't mean anything. But um, for for us, we, we have some performance indicators that we look at, and we, we know generally if, if we hit those performance indicators on a weekly basis or our our standards that you know we'll either win a game or we'll, or we'll not be far off. And, um, what's on, on the screen over there at the moment from the weekend um, and there's lots of green on there which is generally good so a couple of things we, we generally look at is um, our completion rates which is the, the pie chart at the top which is that one hey he's got all the like problems here <laughs> like it that's why he wanted to put it up isn't it? That's <laughs> that's why he to it. expected to get his hands on it <laughs> Um, so yeah, so, so completion rates really are how well we keep hold of the ball um, and at the weekend we, we were pretty good and we generally aim for round about between 80% and 9% and if we get them targets we're not far off, that's why the, the green's there. Um, if that was Dewsbury, that bit would be red and there'd be a little bit of green there. Um, <laughs> and the, the effects of that is, is what it has on our energy. Um, you know, if you keep hold of the ball and you turn it over in the in the right areas, then you've you've got energy to, to defend and push and, and come up with better plays. And you know, ultimately against uh, Dewsbury, we didn't do that. But at the weekend, we we had a real focus in what we were going to do about completing and keeping all of it. So we we did really well. We that's one target for us, which we hit, um, which was our completion. Then we go into our kicking game, which was our high note kicks. Um, obviously the blue ones that. The big one, which is good, the red's negative, so we had a couple of negatives. And we had lots of repeat sets, I think that was seven in that game. And that helps us then again to, to build pressure onto it. Um, then off the back of it, we, we have a look at play the balls inside our 20 metres and inside uh, opposition 20. 
So the red one was what Swinton had in ours, uh, and the green was what we had inside of Swinton. So if you have more field position and you keep hold of the ball, obviously you're going to tie the, the opposition out and get more chance of scoring. Again, uh, against Dewsbury, that one was... <laughs> He's good this fellow. And that green one was hardly anything at all. So it, you know, it, it all just adds into what we're doing. So, you know, they're, they're just little different things that way we have targets and are measurable. And then uh, we look at scrums and, and penalties against. Uh, five minute sets is, is a big one for us. That means how many times we've, we've made the opposition either kick from inside the 40 metres or we'll turn the ball over and. Uh, we're getting above 10, we have 15 against Swinton, then we, we know we've a good chance. Uh, we look at tackles, which is 347, again against Jude, but that was well over 400. Um, and push is people just pushing around the ball, supporting. Uh, and a big one for us, uh, particularly in this game, was that one, which our rook wins. Uh, and that's how slow we've made the rook. And um, we did a really good job against Swinton. Uh, and again, our targets are probably anything above 60%, we're doing really well. Um, again, to give you an indicator, that was probably just below 50 against Dewsbury. So there are indicators, and then on the side, just uh, in the green box, is just some people's efforts off the ball. Um, so the push, Jack Owens at fullback, pushing around the, the ball, carrying support, he was good. He told me to make sure I mentioned that. <laughs> uh, and then we've got a couple of guys in the middle, and just on the carries, um, from the game at the weekend, you've got Epler on 21, uh, Jay Chapel on 20, and Sam Wild on 17. Um, you know, that, those guys did a, did a big stint for us. And I just thought from the weekend, uh, our middle who started, the Twins and Ep did a real good job um, in, in the carries. Obviously, Ted scored a couple of tries. Uh, and defensively, for all those guys, they were really high. So, all, all that just basically gives you uh, an overview of what we look at. Um, then, off the back of that, then I do individual stats. And so every, uh, I'll go through the, the video and, and, and click it up. So everyone's tackles, carries, missed tackles, uh, marker errors, kicks, um, anything basically that I want to put in there. And I'll sit down uh, and I'll go through uh, with the team, we'll do a team review. We've got left, middle, right reviews. Sometimes we'll do a back three, uh, sometimes we'll do the halves. But also I'll get, I'll get these guys to do it as well. So Hep looks after the forwards a lot, Jack looks after the back three. Uh, Gail does quite a bit with the outside back, so uh, you know, these guys have got experience, so uh, I'd, I'd be daft if, if I didn't use that. So that, that usually takes me, uh, I got home from the game Sunday, um, I went to bed probably about just after midnight, Sunday night, and then come in early Monday morning and just finish it off. So you, you, you're probably about four or five hours work as a minimum, just going into that to get it out for the boys. And, um, generally, we we at our targets, we're not far off, and that's our standards, what we try and reach. And um, if you have probably read some of the reports over the last couple of weeks about uh, putting our effort in the wrong areas of the games and, and not being quite up to our standards, that that's what we measure about. And I'm sure Apple will, will talk a bit more about that as well. well that, that's all well and good, like that's from a good performance at Swinton. But when you, how do how do you deal with when you do, go through the stats, as you said, you know, the week previous against Shrewsbury? And they don't look like that. What impact does that have on, on the week's preparation for it up? What sort of things do you emphasise? But one of the things you want to do as a coach is always keep moving forward and improving. Uh, and unfortunately in sports sometimes it happens for, for one reason or another that uh, you don't quite get your performance like, like you wanted. Uh, and then that week just slightly changes for you because you have to go back and go over things uh, and readdress things rather than just trying to keep improving and adding on. So, it, it does change your, your mentality slightly. Um, and I think the, the week against Jews, we, we had a, again, uh, we had a focus for that week about just being rugby smart, and that, that was our theme, uh, and being clever and just uh, thinking about, you know, why we did things, you know, for, you know, for instance, not, not blaming anyone or anything, is, you know, what, why we're chucking the ball into touch play one, um, whereas on the Friday, we, 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 we didn't do that. And, and that comes down to, to decision making. And I think, uh, again, you know, we, we've, some of the old guys, they, they make errors and mistakes, and certainly some of the young guys do, but it's getting to getting them to understand you know, what's made the decision to do that and what could have been a better outcome. Um, and that, that can come through factors in uh, time in the game, what, you know, how long's left on the game, have we completed you know, four or five sets in a row, have we not completed four or five sets? And, and I think ultimately it's just learning the game for, for a lot of people uh, and understanding it. And we have to be, 
happy to win games 10 0. We don't have to win games 60 0 every single week, and probably that was the case at us at York as well. You know, we, we've got to grind some wins out because you're not always going to play to, to the top of your level or, or be right up there. But if you, if you can still win games when you're not at your best, then you've got a good chance of achieving what you want to. Really interesting stuff that. Uh, let's have a little talk about the squad. The squad, and, and you've got some experience. You were involved at Lee in 2016 when they got promotion to Super League. You, you played a part in building that squad. You know, we, we're going in to the close season, hopefully with the aspirations of building a squad that could lead to promotion. That's what we all we all going to be striving for, hopefully. What's the sort of things that, considerations from a coaching point of view, what are the sort of things that you guide you along that, you know, with experience you've already gained? What were the sort of things you'd be looking at if you're looking to make additions to the squad? Well, I think um, everyone's probably watched the, the championship and it is a, a different competition from Super League. Um, ju just an example, just a player over at Huddersfield, um, Ollie Russell, who's been on dual reg at, at, at Batley, struggled a little bit when he's gone to Batley, not had the best performances because the, the game's a little bit slower, a bit more physical, he's a young halfback and he's got a, you know, a lot of older heads around him who are probably a bit stubborn in some of the ways. But when he goes back to, to Huddersfield, he performs at quite a high level and the game looks a lot easier for him because he's got more space and the game's a bit quicker. So it, there is a big difference. Um, and, I, and I thought when I first came into the club, um, I was happy with the squad we won, we, we had, sorry. Um, but I still thought we were probably just a couple of senior guys short of, of being, you know, competing and winning those big games against Toronto. And, um, you know, I thought we, we almost needed a team full of, of what you'd, if you want to talk physical men and uh, a team of younger kids and where the games could be a bit quicker, particularly when we play at home. Um, and again, like people like Jack's been in the championship, there, there's some real good players in the championship. Um, Absolutely. And, and certainly, I think people have a perception that just because we're full-time, we, we have all the best players, not the reality. You know, there's lots of, of good players out there who are part-time, uh, who stay part-time for one reason or another, whether that's work or they just fell out with, with, with uh, full-time rugby and they're really good players and, and, and could push on to, to that next level so it, it has its challenges in recruiting um, the, the venues and the teams you play against also um, have its challenges you know when you go into to Barrow on a really heavy pitch you go into to Batley on the hill and you know you saw the Batley team when they came down the hill they, they recruit players for, for that field uh, big thick heavy middles um, <laughs> and that's what they do. That's the recruit. Uh, Jews were the same. You know, they, they, you know, the big, powerful men. And uh, you know, again, not having to go on, on any of our younger players, but uh, we have outside backs who are probably weighing 90 kilos, tackling people who are 110, 115 kilos, and eventually it's going to take it out of you. Um, so I think when you when you look for for recruiting, you, you need um, that seniority and that maturity within your squad. It's also great, you know, to, to have these young players. You know, if we didn't have the academy and uh, we didn't have these young players, we wouldn't be able to put a team in because you know I've had to delve into there and pull, you know, Ben Davis this year and I know pull Callum out to, to help us out this year. So uh, it is a challenge to put a squad together. Um, you know, financially it's a challenge because again, uh, some of these players who are on part time are very, very good money, uh, and that's why they don't play in Super League. For for instance, you, the players out there are probably. As a ballpark figure, might be a thirty thousand pound Super League player, but his combined rugby and his work money is probably on fifty thousand, so it's not worth him um, going. So financially, as it has its challenges as well. So there's a lot to think about. Um, it, it's not an easy task, and and also you, you've got to, you're competing with, with the other clubs like Toronto and, and Toulouse, the full time clubs who are coming in. Um, so yeah, for, from my point of view, I think experience is good, uh, but the, the energy that the youth brings is good also. Um, and then just trying to get that, that mixture and that balance right. What do you think is the ideal number? What would you do you know, next year? What would you be looking at? What would we be looking at here? Squad size 23, 24? Yeah, Phil's not in his head. <laughs> All right, so he's on. It's been about 17 for the last three weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the last one for the, for the time being to you, Kieran. 1895 Cup. Exciting or distraction? Win it. Now we get somewhere. Now we get somewhere like it. For that time. I'm going to end on that. For the time being, ladies and gentlemen, our very own head coach, Kieran Patel.
say old, old happy. Old happy, as he calls you there, not me. Senior happy. Right, man, obviously you're club captain this year. Club captain of a, of a predominantly very young, very young side. All of which, more than 99% of the nonsense that we, you know, but they first came to the club because you've been here quite a number of years. Now, I think we all, you're not the most, you're a man of actions, not a man of few words, but a man of actions. Have you found it, because you've been, you've probably your profile and been the captain, but also been the, a real senior man in a young team, how have, you, how have you managed to cope with actually being the genuine leader week in, week out, and having to deal with these young whippersnappers? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends who you're talking about. The ones like JJ, and that give me a bit of grief, but uh, <laughs> as, as a whole, I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's, um, you know, it was a big um, honour for me to come up and be club captain, and, um, you know, Perth's um, let me captain the team as well, so, you know, it was a uh, couldn't be more proud and, and what the boys have been doing on the field as well. You you soon forget how young everyone is. Um, so you know it's been it's awesome and I think I learned a lot, especially um, when we had the loss, um, you know, Batley gave us a good game, they pretty much outplayed us. Um, then the York game was just how much pressure there really is and how much you really have to try and manage I'm, I'm not a big talker, um, and as you said, um, so how much I need to rely on all the other boys um, for help. And, but you know, we, we, we're still going hard and I'm really enjoying it. So when you say you're not a big talker, man, who does all the, somebody's got to be doing it. So who's the big, who's the big talkers in the dressing room? Um, Hang on, we've got to, you're, you're getting time after you do it. <laughs> Go on then, who's the, who's... Well, I think, um, you know, Harrison, Harrison Hanson, he's a good talker, you know, he's, um, he's kind of out on the edges and he can see a lot of what the game, what's happening in the game and stuff. For me in the middle, I'm, you know, just struggling to catch my breath. Just busy. You know, <laughs> my best to on, so, um, you know, he, he does a lot, of, a lot of the talking, same as Christine, so lucky, lucky in that way, but, you know, Jack's at the back and see everything. Um, the twins talk a lot, but most of it's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe around the fossil. Just be fuming with that this week. No, they just want to bring a lot of energy and stuff like that. And, you know, we, uh, That's one thing they do, and they always have them. Yeah, so it's the first one they just fall in, aren't they? Yeah, they're not good energy. Oh, it's Tom, Tom Gilmore too. He's a, he's a, he's a halfback and. He's knowledgeable of what's happening and stuff like that. So, um, you know, when he's there, um, he's, he guides the team around a lot. He's good. What about Mr. Johnson? Oh, number nine. <laughs> he's out to the pub, his public persona, he's this cheeky little chappy. What's the reality like behind? He's always in my office. Oh, is he now? He's always in his office. I think he's an apple head or something. <laughs> oh, it depends if he smashed someone in the first half, he'll pipe up at half time and say, Come on, boys, we've got to rip in. But, <laughs> you know, like, you know, he's, he's, um, you know he's, he's like the life of the party kind of kind of guy and gets us through training and brings energy around, around the training field. So, you know, every team has them and it's good to have them there.